And I want to say good morning and hello to everyone here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So nice. <laughs> oh, shoot. Oh, it's mute. Yeah, there we go. I muted you. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're in a special theme right now that's all connected to the larger theme we are working on right now. The creator of the universe has stepped into a new relationship to the world also to become the redeeming healer. So that the first creation, something happened with it in such a way that actually a kind of sickness entered it, a fall away from its true calling. And so he arrived as the world physician to heal and lived as that world cosmic physician in a human being. That really remains and will remain for a long time. The radical revolutionary strangeness of Christianity. That the highest divine spirit could be found in a single human being. It just it breaks apart everything that we can think of because of our sense of the magnitude of the highest divine being. How could that ever come into a human being? And I'm a human being and I don't think that fits. <laughs> so it's a confrontational encounter, Christianity. How could this highest divine spiritual being, why would this highest divine spiritual being want to become a human for the sake of the entire universe? Yes, but that's that's the that's what we Christians confess. We somehow meet that creative spirit in a human. And then this human set about imbuing other humans with his spirit to continue the healing, redeeming work of a new creation in communities and in persons, in what we learned about last time as disciples. Go out and disciple all of the nations. That is, bring them into a relationship. Invite them into a relationship with me where they learn from me. And they learn in such a way that they are opened up to the inpouring of the creative spirit itself. That is his story. He is the human who experienced the heavens torn open the divine spirit entering into him. And that happened when? That is baptism. <laughs> that theme is a big theme that we're working on now. How, how is the mystery of what we do in all of the seven sacraments and especially in the four central sacrament of Christian community, the consecration of the human being or the Eucharist service, how is all of those, how are all of those seven sacraments a continuation of the baptismal work of Christ? The consecrating work of Christ. And what is our part as community members in that congregation that is sometimes not apparent to us because we think it's happening up there with the ones who are dressed in white and the substances in the altar and we are just watching back to it we're really in this theme of overcoming a audience relationship to the sacraments and moving and trying to grow into a this participation, but co-celebration, to celebrate with one another. That means our will and activity, we're doing something.
in the sacrament of baptism in the Christian community as we come to the close of that rite for the child. The priest does a review. It's a classic form, right? Just like in the act of consecration, we do this like, let's do this. And we do it. And then we get to the end and we say, we just did this. <laughs> that is a certain kind of sacramental pattern. Mm -hmm. Before you just jump in, you say, hey, let's do this. Then you enter. And then you come down the steps and say, I just did this. And then you leave. And in the sacrament of baptism, it's similar. There's a beginning where we say kind of, we're about to do this. And we do it, and then we get to the end and we say, we just did this. But what we hear there is very striking. <laughs> we hear. Yeah. I don't know if you want to listen to the whole, but maybe. No. She caught that one. We hear, I have, the priest is saying, talking to the congregation, I have before and with your thinking spirits. Like classical sacramental language, you go, what, what do you say? I don't understand. Can you say that again? I have before in front of you. So I have done something that you have watched, that you've witnessed. I have done this before the thinking spirit in you. But I've also done it with your thinking spirit. That's, that's this added element. All three soul forces are described that way, before and with. So the witnessing is a doing. And there seems to be coming from the attending present ones who are there in love and attention for this child, forces streaming in that the priest needs to even fulfill this sacrament. In fact, we hear that the priests say at the beginning, towards the beginning when they go to baptize the child, aware of myself with the power of the Christ community. Where does my power come from? I need to do, I'm a priest, I'm consecrated. How do I have the power to do this deed? cannot do it out of myself. I need community. So this, this whole gesture that we're, we're just meditating on this year, how are we doing this before? How is the priest performing something that is witnessed? And how is the community also co-celebrating and doing things with together? There needs to be a kind of two, but there is always also a one. So last time we, we, we entered the doorway of the mysteries of Christianity, of life with Christ through the so-called Great Commission. What were our two things that we discovered there? The Great Commission. Co-mission. <laughs> the great co-mission, yeah. Thank you, Joanna, for the spelling help last time. Both ends in there right away. Was the first thing. Jesus gives to his disciples on a mountain, a high place, Galilee, to disciple, go out into all the nations, disciple them, disciple all nations. We spent some time talking about how Christian community then would, would recognize it because you would be seeing discipling happening wherever that community is found. We had some really good conversations also about some of the tensions, how that can go off track. And number two, what was the second one? Immerse them into the Yes. Immerse them in 
Trinitarian following presence and activity immerse their humanity in the divinity. Yeah, and then we spent a little bit of time just contemplating how it is that we do that and fulfill that commission. Started to begin to look at, do we have something like an adult baptism in the Christian community, right? Yeah, so today we want to um, take some further steps with this go a little bit deeper into this mystery of the three crosses that we began to look at last time. And we want to expand that, deepen that together. In other words, why cross? Why three? Why seven times? many questions too. Why those places? Why in the air? Why with the right hand? Why with three fingers? Why we could go on and on, right? And then it's just the next thing you know, you're buried in questions. So we're going to narrow it. Why cross? Why three? Why seven? Hopefully that will start to be something that will lead us into things. So before we do that and enter a new theme together, We'll take up the tradition of this um, gathering, this group, the Christian community here in Toronto, and use this as a moment of a kind of pattern that reveals to us, in part, how to open ourselves to receive a new, a new part of Christ's life. through the, the light of the truth of his reality that we try to gain each week. So if you are facing a screen, you may wish to face something like we have here, a window where there's something like light that comes from the sun rather than from electrodes. A little bit of a different feeling. And then you can position yourself so you have that sense of there's some peace in your body. Maybe you've got a pen and pencil or something, and maybe, maybe you can put it on the papers that are a little like this. Oh. These little maneuvers with our body can really help also open up the soul. Then we can, if we like, we can close our eyes. Now we want to turn our inner soul vision, not towards that outer natural sun, but what is called in the epiphany time, the star of grace. It is divine. It is warm. It is shining. You can imagine that our own heart is actually a cup that can gather light, the warmth and light that pours out from this sun. Say a prayer. <clears throat> My heart be filled with your pure life, O Christ. Amen. 
my heart be filled with your pure love. Feel in that picture how this little cup of ours can't continue at all. It is quickly overflowing. And that's where it then begins to move towards our lips. This prayer that comes then in the gospel portion of our prayers in the Christian kingdom. From thy lips let flow the word, purified from you. One of our new favorite or recent quotes, I forget who it comes from. Maybe someone here remembers. It's one of our early Christian teachers, might even be Augustine. You should always proclaim the gospel and sometimes use words. We are always speaking. Is that Francis? Francis, this, this idea that actually everything we are doing, how we are standing, every gesture, every step is a speaking. It's a speaking. And so this prayer about Christ entering our heart is a part of that. Hope that our speaking be filled with his life. Yeah, and, and this all really connects with the mystery of what we're going to be looking more deeply at, dear friends. This is, this is this cross mystery. So last time I, I mentioned briefly one of the kind of preconceptions that lives in culture, regular culture, and actually in most Christian communities around the world. And what I mean that by that is every church connected with Christ. I don't know if you know that our name, the name of the movement, is not ours. <clears throat> the Christian community is the name for the church, the whole church. That's just so beautiful. I was just reading this morning a letter of an epistle to Diognetes from the 100s, 200s. And he said, let me describe to you the character of the Christian community. It's just the name, Christians in community, or community of Christians. And in this early Christian community, and, and much further on, there was already, right away, confusion about baptism. It's not that we're the only ones who are confused. Actually, the very first Christians were confused about baptism. Like, read the Gospels. Even in the Gospels, there's some confusion. Wait, Jesus is baptizing? I thought John was the baptizer. Why is Jesus baptizing? His disciples who were baptizing. And then you get into the book of Acts. You receive John's baptism. You haven't received Jesus' baptism. Like, what are you talking about? We haven't heard about that baptism. Well, it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he says, just, you're lost in baptisms. How many baptisms are there? There are apparently a lot of baptisms because it means immersion. It means immersion. You're immersed in earth. John comes along, I need to immerse you in water. And he says, but there's someone greater coming from, because he's before me. He is of greater rank than me. He's going to immerse you in breath and fire. So that's at least four things. We're already baptized into the earth when we were born. Another way of describing what it means to incarnate on earth is baptism. You're immersed in matter. It's an immersion in the earth. Welcome to the earth. You can see the angel at the birth of a child as they're heading down. It's like, have an amazing baptism. 
you are about to be baptized in the earth. Our biographies is a long immersion in earth mysteries. Or, and us wrestling with them. It's baptism in the earth. So we need other things. We're so sunk in there. It's like, let me give you some water to get back, back up out of that earth reality. Oh, that allows us to step out of ourselves and see ourselves in the light of conscience, St. John. And we need the breath and fire that comes from Christ. He immerses us in higher elements, which come from the spirit world. Breath in the soul and spirit fire. So there are a lot of baptisms, and then Jesus describes another baptism. We're going to look at the text directly so you guys can see that. I'm going to share my screen here. I hope you guys can see it at home. Sadly, you're going to see a Zoom screen first. Let's see. Oh, that's not Luke 12. So the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 50. So 49, we hear in verse 49, Jesus is talking about how he wants to fulfill what John promised, that he's going to bring fire. So in verse 49 of this chapter, 12, in the Gospel of Luke, we hear, I came to cast fire on the earth and and would that it were already kindled. So I'm here to throw fire on the earth. And the next sentence is, verse 50, I have an immersion to be immersed in with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. I'm, I'm awaiting a baptism. And it's something he wants to accomplish. So Jesus Christ is pointing through, in Luke's gospel, he's showing, I'm looking ahead to the goal of my whole life, which is to die on the cross. And that he is calling a baptism. What is it that Christ is going to be immersed in that he is unfamiliar with? Death. We're very familiar with it, but the divine eternal ones are unfamiliar. He's looking to unite himself with us, which means to know the mysteries we know. But to come through it in such a way that his eternal nature is not threatened by death, but actually he overcomes death and makes death his own servant. So that after he accomplishes this, he passes it out to all of the people he loves. Here, here's some death. You should die. You should die. Here, if you're having trouble dying, just go like this. Put, actually apply death to yourself. This is, shock, this is the shocking thing. He, is, he so wins this victory, he turns death into his servant. You're going to be my friend. You're going to come into people's lives through me in such a way that they are going to actually come to their eternal nature through you. So that now people are not to be afraid of the cross. You see it. Again, you all are very strange who participate in a service in which you worship the Lord of the universe by putting this death marker on you. Again, Again, again. We know it also classically as a sign of protection. Think about that. Uh-oh, the devil's getting near, better die. <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean? Let's think about that again. Uh-oh, the devil's coming near, I better die. The actual secret to defeating the enemy of our true humanity is to willingly die. Because the enemy 
his secret attack point for us is that we don't want to die. The last stage of our highest level of egotism is the absolute and intense and most incredible desire to maintain myself, gripping onto everything I can possibly think of that will work to help with that. Fame, fortune, my body, whatever it is, my opinions. The protection from the enemy becomes the thing he, the enemy used to try to kill him. It was a battle and he won. <laughs> so that <clears throat> when in classical Christianity, then we baptize someone into the community, then we would bring to them the mystery of Golgotha. So the Christ baptism <laughs> has to do with the mystery of the three crosses on that hill. <clears throat> it becomes the seal of the Lord. Every king has a seal, right? You get a message and someone says, I've got a message from the king. You're like, prove it. And you got to make sure it's not a forgery. And so the king has a special seal takes some wax, gets it hot, drips it on the letter, closes it, and puts his seal into the wax. And he, it's very important that he's the only one who has that seal. The sign and seal of that that leads back to this being, this Lord. In the book of Revelation and in the letters of Paul, we hear that all of the Christians are sealed. And they will have the seal of the Lord on their foreheads. So, br so bringing people in relationship to this one, you have to bring them in relationship to this sealing power. There's a special marker that gets marked and impressed <laughs> into the beings who are related to him. These three crosses. So this happens at the end of the child baptism, for example, in a powerful way. We hear that. We see the child there. They've been baptized with the water, salt, and ash and named. And that concludes with three crosses, large crosses over the child. We hear it described in a beautiful fashion. I can stop to share so you can see it better. The priest makes the sign of this cross over the child and says, in the father's substance of worlds. One big cross. In the Christ's streaming of the word. Second big cross while making it. In the spirit's brightness of light. Another beautiful example of how the phrase in the name is transformed into a frame, a, a picture and activity that you can relate to. When we say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, what do we mean? Father's substance of worlds the Christ's streaming of the word. It's brightness of light. And you can feel, can you feel the relationship to those same powers that we also do when we do these crosses now in the vertical going down a little bit? The Father God be in us. The sun god create near the 
speech organ, this Christ streaming of the word, create in us? We are word beings. In the Spirit's brightness of light, we say, the Spirit God, enlighten us. So why crosses then? All of this has to do with one core secret. And, and that is, we need to be unmade to be remade. Anything that has already come into its own nature and form is finished. Therefore, it is not open to any new activity. It's like the experience that our students had last year. They worked with Regina Kirik doing art. They did all this painting and you reach a kind of end and then they tore all that up. And now they had new things to work with and they made new things. If things are in their kind of finished state or form, Nothing new can happen. There must be an unmaking in order to have a new creative event happen. Similarly, you cannot eat your food by just putting it in your body. You know, can you imagine? Nice little plate of spaghetti. Just kind of like find a spot for it. Just put it on. <laughs> Insert it in your leg. We actually stick it into the chopper or dum, 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 and send it down into poisons that are very powerful and destroy it like intensely. Get it hot. Like if you ever cough any of those stuff up, you know how destructive those are. Sorry for that image, memory that I just called up, but you got to, you know, taste it. <laughs> We think, you know, we're, you know, human beings are, you know, beautiful, wonderful things. But there's some poisonous, powerful forces at work in here for our sake. Destroying the form of what we've taken in, opening up that matter so that our spirit can take it up and actually make it into our body and not be spaghetti monsters. We actually have to utterly destroy it and remake it into our form. Destroy this temple. And I will rebuild it in three days. This is one of the secrets of the I am of Christ. Something that was is to be destroyed for the sake of a new creation. And a Christian is a person who realizes it's not going to work if I just continue as I am in my life. That's the first marker. Whoever I've been isn't going to cut it. This is not, a, this is, I cannot fulfill what it means really to be who I long to be. I need to be newly made. And Jesus says, here's a cross. I'll show you the route to new creation. And that's where, of course, we go, well, I feel like I need to become a different person. I need more spirit in me. I need more the working of God in me. We come towards it. And he's like, here's the cross. We're like, well, uh, could I do the version where I get to just stay like I am and like just get like some more God? It's like, well... Giving a lot of God already. The need that you have right now is actually being made through God. It's not going to work to like give you a slightly tastier meal than you've already had, or just a little bit of this. Like the real way through, I, at least my way, is through the cross. I'm not going to just make you do it and not do it myself. Don't worry. 
I'm going to go ahead of you. I'm going to show you what it means to go through that. It's not easy. But I know that in my trust in the power of my love relationship with the Father, he will remake me and rise, cause me to rise. And we see this so powerfully done in the act of consecration. We'll just take one little example today as one way in which we see this taking place as a kind of pattern. And then we'll, it'll be a little bit outside of us and then we'll come back probably next week to look at how this relates to our own unmaking and remaking. But maybe I'll just stop there for a second and just see if there was any burning question or comment that came up. Just speak up, raise your hand. After those three classes on Balgata, I mean, we know that two of them are criminal, Christ is in the center. How do we like, imagine this? I know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's the relationship of those two? Yeah, it's a that's a deep, deep study. And it's really unique to Luke's gospel in the way in which it's characterized, where they get voices and we get to know their character. And I encourage you to go into Luke's description of the crucifixion to 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 contemplate those mysteries. Um, for now, I'll leave that aside because it would just take us a little far afield. It's enough to know that the three crosses seem to be essential in the activity and never just one actually. And that's connected to the name of the, the, the Trinity, the mystery of the Trinity, yeah. So they don't represent the other two who were crucified with them? They, these? Yeah. No, I would say they, so if, would we be saying that Jesus is God and the Father and the Holy Spirit are criminals? That's kind of a problem, right? So it can't be like that. And we find that quality in their story. One longs for paradise. The other one mocks and longs to protect himself in the earth, wants to come down from the cross. That's, and there he is in the middle. But that's, it's something you need to kind of go with your own perceptions. But that, the, the naming of the criminal <clears throat> reveals us, because there are many trinities. There are many trinities. There is the trinity of John, Mary, and Jesus. That's a different, that's actually the, the three, the three forces in their balanced order. And then there are the criminals, the enemies, Jesus Christ between Lucifer and Arima. There's also the Holy Trinity, and that's where we're going to focus. <clears throat> I then I came to the Christian community, and the priest said something about yes, yes, and something. <laughs> I think that was it, yeah. Yeah, and then eventually I was told that I, what I did, I didn't put the priest there. Right. I did the three crosses. Yes. And the mystery to me is what does the priest? Yes, so Lydia Murray's question is coming out of the Catholic Church with a single cross that the congregation member did. And then she came to the Christian community and saw the priest doing a single cross but with a circle. So 
father is the upright, the first one from above to below, the father God, the son from left to right across the shoulder clavicle area, son God create in us. And then the spirit God, this circle around, which is familiar in Christian tradition as the sun cross, particularly in Celtic Christianity. And the community members do this triple crosses, three crosses actually moving down from this third eye area, the speech area for the sun, and then the heart area for the spirit. So there are a lot of mysteries there, of course, and hopefully we'll get a chance to look at the sacrament of ordination, where we see for the first time the priest is being ordained, having that priest cross inscribed upon them. And when it's first done, we get, we get, we get a little insight into what's happening and why. But basically, the priest is up there not as an individual, as soon as they are consecrated and wearing vestments. But they're actually sh revealing to us the spirit of the community. That is, each community has an angel, and normally we can't see them. When the priest comes into the chapel in their vestments, we can. <laughs> Their, their job, the, the whole job of the ritual is to make the angel of our community visible. And you see, it's also Kate or also Jonah. But you can tell something's different. He, look, he, he looks different. And that has to do with also that a priest is consecrated with oil with three crosses. On the forehead and on the hands, two crosses. So three crosses also for opening them up to the influence of the Trinity for the community. And that's the last bit of oil. It says poured out. I, I'm still waiting to see in a, a, a priest ordination where you know really get a an oil pour. It's like three drops, you know, so but it says poured out. In the crown chakra area, this this place where the fontanelle would open, would be open as if for when you're a child, right? The place St. Francis shaved his hair away so he could maybe still receive some influence. Why why do those monks do that, right? You're like, wow, where with that haircut. <laughs> it has to do with this secret that they're trying to open their own eye to the eye of a greater being. And that's what's said there, it's that you're that you unite your being with the being of the community. So the oil is to open the fissure that closed in your skull in a very gentle spirit way. And that also has to connects with the priest cross, which we'll look at another time. What is said when the, when the, candidate is actually has that inscribed on it. It's very interesting. It's not what we hear for the baptism of the child, what I just described. It's different. So we'll leave that as a kind of teaser <laughs> for when we get to the to the work with the sacrament of ordination. Yes, Nicola? Yeah. olive oil that we that we consecrate yeah olive oil is used in these mm -hmm. in that sacrament okay well oh, yes please Karen Jonah you know, I read this uh, book about how the Wissengemeinschaft and uh, something is came out of this and then in one it states which I found quite fascinating that during the service there are also elemental spirits present even adversary forces are not kept out mm -hmm. they are all there do you have an experience of this? oh 
Uh, so <clears throat> Karen asked about some things she learned recently in, from a book about the presence of elemental beings and adversarial beings in the act of consecration, the consecration of the human being. And then she asked me, do I have experiences of this? <laughs> I would love to share sometime some of those things if it could be fruitful. But just sharing my spiritual experiences as a celebrant isn't very interesting to me. I think because it's not interesting to God. <laughs> that is because he's interested in building up his community. But carrying that as a question, I think, is really beautiful. How are they present? Who notices what? Talk to each other, too. And why do I want to know? Am I just curious... Or do I have a burning life question that I'm wrestling with that can help guide me in how I get to the answer? Mm -hmm. And today I feel a pressure from somewhere else to lead us to something, a, a different topic. But I, maybe it will relate in adversity. The other thing is that you can bring into the service with your mind uh, those who have disease, uh, are in trouble. Uh, and I, think, I think that is a wonderful idea. It's just very difficult mm. to maintain that throughout the service. Yes. Karen was saying also we can bring in people who are in need, people who have died, people who might need our prayers actually into the service, but that it can be a challenge to remember that or do that while we're praying and participating. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's take a look at this mystery of unmaking and remaking by looking at the wine and the bread in the service. So we'll kind of use that as a little bit of a picture and pattern for this mystery. So in the consecration of the human being, when it first begins, the congregation is gathered, seated, seated in their chairs. The altar is there with its three steps, its altar and seven candles. They are not lit at first. And we see there is this room with the door. We see people coming in and out, preparing. And part of the preparation is substances are brought out and placed on some kind of a surface, a table. And the substances that are there, we see the incense and the incense holder, the censer. And we see also two little cans of water, one of water, one of grape juice. So they're there waiting. That's a first kind of interesting thing to observe. The wine is in the room. The bread is actually brought in after the candles are lit on the chalice, hidden under a veil. Right, the riddles abound. And only after the gospel and the sermon have happened and the creed have happened, is that veil lifted? And there we discover there's a plate, not just a cup, there's a plate. And you can't usually see it very well from the congregation, but you see the priest usually doing something like, like a little movement of a lift, a move, and a set. So you, you could know because they get to communion, there is a plate with some bread on it. And that's where it's being taken off. So the plate with bread on it, pieces of bread, small pieces, hosts there called in tradition, are placed on the table. But what mentioned? When did when, which substance? The wine. The wine, right? So also, not only is the wine already in the room, but actually we experience that the servers bring that to the 
priest holding the chalice and it is poured in. First, the juice. And there we hear it connected with our willing. So you are willing turn, this dark, sweet juice of the grape poured in. And then comes water. Why, why would you add water? This is another one of those riddles. Why not just take the juice? It's too strong. It's too strong. Got to thin it out for sure. Because yeah. water and blood came out of Christ. Water and blood came out of Christ at the cross, as John describes it in his gospel. Yes, that's true. That doesn't necessarily explain it. It's like a next riddle. <laughs> That the water was us. Well, what do we say with the water? As we pour the water in, water in is it this willing? Is, willing? is it etherizing? Is it What's bringing that? the etheric forces into the wine? These are all connected. These are all connected well, to the to the to the elements. So we're moving in the offering. We're passing through the whole world of the elements. We've talked about the burial, the earth is there. Now we have the fluid elements and we're about to go to fragrance and smoke. And then at the end, we close with fire. So we're really passing through all of the elemental world. And as we do so, it's also connecting with our soul forces. It's extraordinary. But what's happening, what literally concrete happens if you have grape juice and it's in that cup and you pour water into it, the fragrance increases. Now, the celebrant is pretty much the one who knows this because it, you need to be near, but it breaks the juice. As much as juice can be broken, it can't really be broken, but in the quality of the way in which the fragrance is released, you can have this experience. The, the tendency to, of the juice to etherize, which is already there is helped actually the pouring in opens it up and then we say may my thinking live in the life of the holy spirit over the cup so there is a kind of opening of the juice with the pouring and it's being done as an offering to you this a ground of the world this draft of health we poured in our soul forces and we're raising it up as a drink to God, the drink offering. Is the bread brought into the offering portion? Not even mentioned. That should be amazing and surprising to us, but we're all so used to it, we don't even notice it. We do all this pouring, you think the next thing you do is, okay, let's take the bread and let's do something with it. We don't. We go through a whole other first section of the transubstantiation, talking about the soul forces before we even mention the bread. It's just sitting there on the plate through the whole offering and the first half of the transubstantiation until we say, let live, O Father God, in this Christ offering, the body and the blood of your Son. So we start to move towards the bread mystery and then we move into the reenactment of the meal, the taking of the bread and the breaking of the bread. So we don't just take the bread and ask it to be filled with Christ either or connected with God either. We also break it in half, the, lar the larger host, and then we break off a tenth of it and place it in the cup. So now the cup also has been broken by the bread. You can imagine the juice a little bit like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you are of a very different nature. Something is, else has been added to the wine. And the bread is needed to be connected with the salt element. And the juice can be the phosphorus sulfur elements, these elements that are this etherizing. So this more earth oriented and this more ether. Are you starting to see those two again? 
So the polarities of that which wants to go towards heaven and that which tends towards earth are being worked with by the one. And you know this from the Last Supper, the way in which Leonardo has one hand down, one hand up. He himself has blue-red crisscrossing through. He's working in this polarity mystery. Always creation is. And so we have this breaking of the bread, breaking of the wine. And then we hear something done after he passes those out to his disciples, a silent event there at the altar that also is hard to see. Three crosses over the bread and wine. So let, let's back up for a second and just go through that step again. So juice and bread are not actually natural. Right? We don't have a plate of grapes and wheat. Actually, these things already have been broken. Stomping on the grapes is the classic picture. Grinding of the wheat after it's flailed. You flail the wheat first to get it loose from its casing. And then you grind the corn, the kernels, to get the flour. Now you've add water and salt and maybe some yeast. And you put it in some kind of fire element and it's got a, I mean, it's an amazing amount of transformation, particularly for the bread. But also some filtering at least with the juice. So culture, human culture has actually already entered. So we have nature, culture, we have a third layer now. Now by being brought into the ritual, we're bringing cultural gifts, bread and wine. What, what gifts? Spiritually speaking, we could say Cain gifts. Things that have been born of human effort and work on the earth. Those now are also broken. And so, for example, when the priest then, so that then they're, they're broken. And then over them also is drawn this. The secret of the seal of the mystery of Golgotha. Sorry? It's over them. It just have that they're they're on the table like that, so they have to get their cross like that. We're standing upright or sitting upright, so we do our crosses like this. Can you imagine that you are a plate of bread <laughs> and you're a cup that's open up? So they're opened this way, so they receive their crosses over them, just like us actually. The only yeah. the bread behind the cup. The bread is behind the cup. Yeah. But the key is that they're just both there in a line. Upside down. Yeah, it's also upside down. Yeah. Like this. So from here, the chest towards the candles. And they receive their... Another way of saying it, we break these substances and then bring the crosses over them. Then we remember the mystery of Golgotha. We speak about on the cross will the body bear the new confession. From the cross will flow in the blood the new faith. So now in our very mind's eye is the whole mystery of Golgotha. And then we lift them up and say, let this be. No longer natural fruits. No longer bread, but Christ's body and blood. So their own 
their own nature is broken open so they can be united with his nature. They go through a death to receive his life. In other words, what we're doing there on the table is what normally is hidden inside the body in digestion. That is this, the one who says, destroy this temple and I will build it up in three days. Build it again. We open up this material to the builder, to the temple builder. And he can work in this formative, creative way to imbue it with a new reality. But it first has to be broken and receive the cross. And so we see this pattern, the secret of the pattern is already set in the first creation in the book of Genesis. God is there hovering, brooding over what? Is it water? Darkness. The abyss. Darkness. The watery abyss. It's like a fluid, unformed chaos. It's formlessness, void. It is, but it is something. And that's the, it needs to be this open, dark, chaotic reality there for the creator to get in and start shaping and making. It's really no difference than going to the beach and working with the sand. It's no different. What is the sand at the beach? What is the sand at the beach? It is the ash of the mountains. Right? Mountains have been crumbling, water's been breaking them apart. They've been going through, it's the dead mountains. And now because they've been broken down to a small enough form, children can come and make castles. Mermaids bury each other. It's open to creative energy. Things need to be broken down to become open to creative energies. That's the secret. So as a closing, let's turn our attention back then to the first Christian community. How did they understand their baptism? St. Paul does a beautiful job articulating it so powerful. Oops, sorry. Is that right? Yeah. We can go into chapter six of the letter to the Romans, for example. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, so immersed into him, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Have you ever even heard this? Why? Why would, why would that be the thing? That doesn't, sound, that doesn't sound good, right? Who wants to do that? In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Our first human being needs to be broken. We, and the amazing thing is, things can enter our life that break us. 
or we can break ourselves. The cross is really, you could say, the work of trying again and again to break myself open, die to who I've been, to open to who God can transform me into. I'm willingly entering the unmaking that the Trinity may remake me in their image. Let's go to Colossians. Also really beautiful. Or Galatians. Another really, let's do Galatians chapter 3. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We're putting him on. What are we doing when we're crossing ourselves? But putting Golgotha on our being. But apparently, again, it's not enough once. It's seven times in that single service. And if you go to every service, then every Sunday for that whole year, 52 times seven. And, and Irene, how many, how many years have you been going to the Christian community? 40 times 52 times seven. Is that right? And then each of those crosses is three. So it's three. So 21 crosses. It sounds like you've been immersed. <laughs> right? It's an immersion. It's just like drenching in the mystery of Golgotha. Again and again, and you'll see actually once we look and step back and look at an entire year, the whole year is three crosses. Every year we go through all of these services and they themselves, we are all receiving this seal upon us as we pass through the Christian year. <laughs> till we get to the moment of the transubstantiation of the year, which is Good Friday and Easter. That's the moment where we watch and participate with him, con-celebrate with him the mystery of being unmade and remade. And in the Christian community, we have this very strange tradition. The gospel readings are very clear. We have no Maundy Thursday reading. All of us priests are like, ah, oh, we miss it. Can we just do it? So we do a Vesper on Thursday so we can get that in in the evening. Because in the morning, we don't read it. What do we read on Thursday morning in the Christian community? Good Friday. The Christian community, Good Friday starts on Thursday, moves into the central element on Friday, and completes on Saturday. The readings, the readings of the cross in the Christian community in its liturgical gospel year is three days. Three days of crucifixion. It's only understandable when we understand this is what's going on. The same thing that is happening in the bread and the wine in the middle of the transubstantiation of the single act of consecration is happening in the act of consecration of the year. Three crosses over us and over that mystery. That's what we want to move deeper into also. And next time we only got to the three a little bit and we haven't got to the seven. So next time, I really look forward to starting to move. Why we do that seven times? What is this pattern of this immersion in the act of consecration? And then maybe look a little bit. We'll see if we can get to the year. Thank you all very much for your attention. And I hope you can take these crosses out with you mm -hmm. and do them anew in new ways. It's renewing, hopefully, when you go dare to make three fingers together and put that cross oh. upon yourself. Oh, thank, thank you, you all George. very much. Oh.